coming up next on the Passion Struck Podcast. I am so attuned to the preciousness of every single moment. Truly, way that is um, people, my friends, my partner say like, this is who you are for me. You, you remind me constantly of like how it all could change in a moment, how precious this present moment is and this time together. And so I've done the work to be ready to die myself. Welcome visionaries, creators, innovators, entrepreneurs, leaders, and growth seekers of all types to the Passion Struck Podcast. Hi, I'm John Miles, a peak performance coach, multi-industry CEO, Navy veteran, and entrepreneur on a mission to make passion go viral for millions worldwide. And each week I do so by sharing with you an inspirational message and interviewing high achievers from all walks of life to unlock their secrets and lessons to becoming passion struck. The purpose of our show is to serve you, the listener, by giving you tips, tasks, and activities you can use to achieve peak performance and pursue the passion-driven life you have always wanted to have. Now, let's become passion struck. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Passion Struck Podcast. And thank you to each and every one of you who come back every single week to listen and learn to live better, be better, and impact the world. And if you're new to the show, or you would just like to introduce it to some friends and family, a great way to do that is through something we have called Starter Packs. These are collections of your favorite episodes grouped by topic that give any new listener a great feel for everything that we do here on the podcast. Just go to passionstruck.com slash starter packs to get started. And I truly appreciate it when you share the show to other like-minded individuals. Today's guest on the show is Kate Shutt. Kate is an award-winning songwriter, singer, guitarist, and producer, whose voice NPR calls glassly clear and glassly sweet. She studied poetry at Harvard, where she was a two-sport Division I athlete, as well as guitar at the Berkeley College of Music. In today's discussion, we go into what her life was like growing up with two older brothers and how that impacted her direction, both in sports and music, Tina Turner's influence on her life and career. We discuss the TED Talk she gave titled Brief Casserole about her experiences taking care of her mom as she was going through stage four ovarian cancer. We also discuss the lessons that she learned from that and how she applies them to clients that she coaches today who are suffering from grief, trauma, or other ailments. We talk about her division one sports career at Harvard and the lessons that she learned from that, what it was like to go to the School of Music at Berkeley. And finally, we discuss her new album, Bright Nowhere, which is dedicated to her mother. Thank you for choosing Passion Struck and choosing me to be your host and guide on your journey to living an intentional life. Before we begin, I would like to emphasize that this podcast is part of my desire and effort to bring zero cost information to the general public. In keeping with that theme, I would like to thank the sponsors of today's episode. 80 million Americans, both men and women, experience thinning hair. It's common, even normal, but it's not openly talked about. So going through it can feel lonely and frustrating. That is why it's so important to take charge of your hair growth and make the next few months your time to grow thicker, fuller, healthier hair with Nutrafol. Don't wait to start addressing early stages of thinning hair. Nutrafol is clinically shown to improve hair growth and thickness in just three to six months. I'm already using it and seeing improvements in just a few weeks. And it's physician formulated to be 100% drug-free with potent botanicals to help you grow hair as strong as you are. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com and using promo code PASSIONSTRUCK to save $15 off your first month subscription. This is their best offer available anywhere, and it's only available to U.S. customers for a limited time. Plus, free shipping on every order. Get $15 off at Nutrafol.com spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code PASSIONSTRUCK, for hair as strong as you are. Producing a quality podcast requires a lot of content creation. 
and I'm constantly looking for ways to up my game in efficiency. That is why I love Grammarly and use it daily, whether it's writing podcast show notes, an article, my solo episode scripts, or just for email and social media posts. Grammarly not only helps me with spelling and grammar checks, but it is a writing tool that helps ensure my content is professionally written. They even have unique capabilities for tone adjustments, clarity suggestions, and full sentence rewrites. Do you also want to save time and strike the right tone with your audience? Get through those emails and your work quicker by keeping it concise, confident, and effective with Grammarly. And they're offering Passionstruck listeners a special discount. Go to Grammarly.com slash Passionstruck to sign up for a free account. And when you're ready to upgrade to Grammarly Premium, get 20% off for being my listener. That's 20% off at G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y.com slash Passionstruck. Please consider those who support the show and make it possible and free for our listeners. Now, back to Passion Struck. I am so excited today to have Kate Shutt on the podcast. Thank you, Kate, so much for joining. Ah, I'm so glad to be here, John. So, so great we can make it work. It's been a minute since we set it up and since we got here. Yes, well, it's good to see your face again. because I think the last time we talked was before the holidays. So, correct. Well, I thought a great starting point for people to understand you is maybe what was it like growing up with two older brothers? <laughs> I, I have, I'm the oldest, so I've got a younger sister and brother, but uh, I, I've always kind of wanted to know what's it like being the youngest, especially when you've got to live behind two brothers? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, it's great. I mean, I love, I've, I've always loved, I, I look up to my brothers immensely. They're incredible men and fathers and brothers and sons now. They're just, uh, they're amazing. They're my best friends in a lot of ways. And, um, and I have to say, as a kid, I, I was that, that little sister that they didn't really want around. And I think they'd be, they'd, they'd have no problem telling you that. I mean, who wants their baby sister tagging along when you're growing up? Um, but it tag along indeed I did, you know, they're the one they're responsible for getting me into ice hockey, which turned into a huge part of my life. And I wouldn't be who I was today, who I am today without that. And because they were boys, I was playing boys hockey really until I went away to prep school to play girls hockey, which was the only way I could do that. Um, so it was amazing. They're amazing guys, each in their own right. I still learn so much from them. They're my they're my idols in a lot of ways. So is there any interest that you gained outside of them? Meaning they introduced you to sports, they introduced you um, to fishing, to they introduced me to yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, great question. I mean, I guess the biggest difference for us is that they seemingly weren't very interested in music. I mean, they are now. Um and they're great fans and they both have incredible voices. Like they could have been musicians, professional musicians or whatever. They could have taken it however far they wanted to take it. And indeed my oldest brother sang in an acapella group in high school, but, um, but really like my parents were hell bent on having somebody play an instrument because my dad's side of the family was very musical and um, I was the only one left. So, <laughs> <laughs> At age 10, when my brothers were like 17 and whatever, 15, 14, um, uh, I was, I started uh, piano lessons, 10 or 11, I can't remember. I think I, I think I usually go with 11, so maybe 11. Um, somewhere around there, my parents said, oh, you're, you're starting piano lessons. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how I got into music was because I was the only, I was the youngest. Well, we introduced both of our kids, and I think I told you this previously, to piano when they were very young. I Mm -hmm. I think they were both probably four or five. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting the impact that it has made on both of them, especially, I think, their creative thinking. Mm. Um, Yeah. But my son is more of of the type that um, I could play him, you know, a Foo Fighters song like Everlong. And he can hear it one time and 
sit down now either at a piano and drum or or percussion and and play it. Amazing. My daughter, my daughter, on the other hand, um, is the type where she will go on YouTube and look at the videos, but she's really studying the notes um, mm -hmm. to try to understand um, how to play it precisely. Yeah, and it's so, it's so interesting just in that example how the two of them um, approach music so differently. Totally. Um, well, kudos to you for uh, starting them so young. And in retrospect, from my the ripe old age of 46, <laughs> I wish I had started at four. Um, but still, music's amazing. And it doesn't matter. I mean, a lot of people start and come back to it. And I always tell, obviously, people, friends of mine who have kids are always asking me, like, what should I start them on? And when should I start them? And what instrument? And do you have a teacher to recommend and all that? And I always just say, you know, start them on anything, whatever their whatever sparks their interest, because that's that might not be where they end up. I didn't end up I play piano, I don't play it publicly, but I play it. And of course, I had to play it all through my career and music school and everything like that. Um, you're required to play. I play a lot of instruments now. And I know so many high level musicians who started on one instrument and switched to another. So well, if you know, piano, you can pretty much I think pick up almost anything. It's so, the whole orchestra, for sure. It's the whole gamut. Yeah, and I think I shared these stories the last time we talked, but uh, my son, when he started um, eighth grade, we had moved from living in North Carolina to Texas, and he really mm -hmm. wanted to be in the, the school band, which was a huge band. I mean, even their middle school band probably had 200 kids in it. Whoa. But he wanted to play percussion, and the only wow. way in this school because so many people wanted to play percussion is that you had to have a background in playing piano and yeah. in literally one year he went from never playing before and we got him a, a tutor that he loved who, mm -hmm. who was in his early 20s and played mm -hmm. in bands himself and by the end of the year he was the eighth chair um in the state of texas which was yeah. pretty pretty remarkable and then you know i think my daughter's story is even funnier um how she wanted to join a band um, uh -huh. and was thinking of what instrument to play. And uh -huh. she started looking at the scenario and she goes, you know, dad, if I'm going to play with three dudes in a band, one of them is going to be the lead singer. Another was going to want to play lead guitar and the other is going to be the drummer. So I think my best bet is to try bass, which is exactly what she did. And, and if you're good at it, everyone wants a female in the band and a basis. So I don't know where she got it at 14, 13, 14 years old, but uh, I don't know your experience, but I think she's freaking brilliant. Out. That's all I have to say. If you're a drummer or a bassist, you will always work. Uh, if you have good time and good rhythm and, and uh, good feel and uh, you're a good hang, you're, you'll always work. There's always a spot for you. <laughs> well, I'm going to lead to another question for you, um, but I'm sure. going to start out by telling a story. I had a favorite uncle. Uh, unfortunately, he died when he was about my age from lung cancer. But um, mm. when I was in my late 20s or early 30s, um, he told myself and my parents a story that I couldn't believe. So many of my friends wish they could have seen Led Zeppelin at some point in their life. And it turns out I actually did in my first concert unknowingly when yeah. I was about two years old my uncle who is a very big free spirit probably was one of the people um, that you would see at festivals back in the day and <laughs> Grateful Dead concerts had oh, me on yeah. his shoulders at a Led Zeppelin concert unbeknownst to anyone when I was two um, but I understand you went to a concert um when you were younger, and I love your web page because mm, thank you. you know you ask if there was one thing you would grab, what would it be? Most people would would assume it would be your musical instrument. But yeah, if the if the if the building was burning down, what would I grab? That's the that's the answer, right? And when I read the next page, your answer surprised me, and I think yeah. the audience would like the story. Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, I have to say what an what an amazing uncle. Like you're so lucky. I strive to be that kind of an aunt for my nieces and nephews um, because I too had a, I had an aunt who was a free spirit and uh, the black sheep and just a totally different 
kind of person than her six brothers and sisters. My mom, she was on my mom's side of the family, my mom's next closest sibling. And uh, she knew that I loved Tina Turner because um, in 1985, I was 10 years old and that record came out and um, the private dancer record. And I was just, I just went wild for it. And um, so she knew this. I mean, it was all I did, all I listened to, all I sang. Uh, I was always a singer. Like I always, my parents had like lots of music around. So I was always singing along. And um, and so she, Tina went on tour and uh, and she was, my aunt lived in, in near, in Kentucky, about a couple hours away from Lexington. And um, she called up my mom and said, you know, I'd really like to take Kate to go see uh, Tina at Le in Lexington at the big arena. And luckily for me, my mom and dad said yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sort of the rest is history. I traveled down there by myself. I think that was the first time I went on a plane by myself. And um, back in the day, no cell phones, you know, no, nothing, nothing like what we have today. And, and I spent the weekend with her and a week, probably. I think it was more than that. Anyway, and I got to see Tina and I have I still have the program. I mean, it's unfortunately I don't have it in this room with me, but it's right downstairs. And uh, I look at it all the time. It's this big, great, big. I mean, back in the day when you went to concerts, you, you they sold these huge like broadsides, like with color pictures and essays and the list of all the tour dates. And it's amazing when you look at it now. Holy smokes, that year. God, she was working her ass off. <laughs> Well, it's amazing how many um, stars today credit a lot of what they do to seeing her or following her. Um, I, I just was always marveled at the energy that she would bring to those shows. Uh -huh. and, and I have no idea how she can do it um, every single night. Yeah, I've, since then, I've seen her on tour every time she's been out on tour. So, um and one one tour, not the most, the, the sort of last tour, there were two last tours, I think, not the most recent one, which now was in like 2008, I think. But the one before that, I saw, I saw her like three times on that tour. I mean, I just felt like saw her in New York, and then I saw her in the middle of the country. And then I saw her in, in California. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. I, uh, I truly don't understand. Well, actually, I got a little bit of an insight into it because, and this is cool. Maybe you can link to this. You can find this and link to this for your the people listening. Is that Harvard Business School interviewed her uh, sort of on the occasion of the musical. There's a Broadway musical now about her life, yes. which is amazing. Of course, I've seen it. Um, it's incredible. Uh, I think it was on the occasion of that or on the occasion and she just recently got inducted into the Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is like a crime and a tragedy. I don't know why it took them this long. Um, but anyway, you can go online and find that article and it's an interview with her. And they talk, they ask her a question about like what she does to prepare for her huge live shows. And there's so much more in there that you should read. I almost don't want to say, like, make you go read it, but I'll give you the the uh, spoiler, which is that um, basically, you know, she's a really established Buddhist at this point. Um, that's no, that's nothing new. And and so she she basically meditates and chants for an hour, for an hour's length before a show. And she talks about how when she's doing that, she she envisions every single person in the audience which she's playing she's selling out madison square garden uh and that they they are there and they're having an, a happy fulfilling time and that her music you know helps them sort of get to the next place in their life i'm paraphrasing here but you can go read it for yourself but when i read that because i had the same question you did because I've seen her so many times. I just don't understand how a person can get that much energy put onto them and how I, as the person who's watching her, feel that much energy coming back at me. Um, and this helped me see a little bit into it. Well, I think another good um, link to check out is, I'm not mm -hmm. sure if you've seen the Netflix uh, movie about yes. Pink. Oh, yeah. Um, I said, yes, I've seen the pink. Yeah, totally. It yeah. was shocking to me that as she's being propelled in the air, at times she's pulling 
two to four G's and she had to learn how to sing while doing G's at the same time, which yep. to me was a unbelievable yeah, and, feat. And you know what? I was watching that video and I, I'm obviously, I, I listen to Pink's music just like everybody in America listens to Pink music, sort of by osmosis. I mean, I'm a fan, but I'm not like an uber fan. Um, but I was watching that video and her manager comes on and her manager is Tina Turner's manager, Roger Davies. Roger Davies was the guy who basically took on Tina when she had nothing after leaving Ike. Like he was her manager. He managers are hugely important in the music industry. Like they say in a lot of ways, they make or break you because they open all the doors. They're the ones fighting for you because you can't wear all those hats. And so I, was, I didn't know that he was her was Pink's manager, at least during that time of that video. So I was watching along and I see him because I just know everything about Tina Turner. And I was like, that's Robert, that's Roger Davies. No wonder, no wonder Pink is this like at that level of performance. It's, it's unbelievable uh, going from someone who just stands sedentary to doing the things that she does and, and yeah. really bringing forth. I mean, I can understand it if, if you play guitar, or you play an instrument, but her instrument is her voice. So the stuff that she's able to do, just like Tina Turner, is pretty amazing. Yeah, so, and it's the whole show, putting on the show. Her, her shows are just as amazing as Tina's shows. It's about the experience. It's, it's, yes, it's about the music, of course. The music is why we're there, but there's so much more that's going on. Absolutely. Well, for the listener who might not be aware of your own music, Mm -hmm. I know you have a, a new album um, that's out right now. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what, besides Tina Turner, were your influences for the unique sound that you have? And then talk a little bit about that new album, Bright Nowhere. Sure. Um, I mean, yeah, Tina Turner sort of is where, is where it all starts. I mean, I, I'd say the second biggest influence on me is, in terms of songwriting, is the songwriter Cole Porter, writer of Great, a lot of great American jazz standards, songs like uh, um, Let's Do It, Love for Sale, um, You're the Top. I mean, these, these sort of classic American songbook songs. Uh, he's, he's what I would call my biggest influence songwriting wise. And so my music I, is a mix. You know, I'm trying, basically what I'm trying to do is write the song that Cole Porter would be writing if he was a female, in the 21st century uh, and had my life experience. So I'm, I'm gay, grew up as an athlete mostly, not, not really as much of an, you know, I've just got this background. So like, if he were me, if I were him, what kinds of songs would I be writing? So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to write the songs that an Ella Fitzgerald, if she were alive today, would be singing or a Diana Krall, who is alive today, obviously, like the kinds of songs she wants to sing. Um, and so for Bright Nowhere, I mean, I'm always trying to do that. And but, but because I started playing guitar very soon after I started playing the piano and I was in a true garage band for like all my life, basically uh, playing Grateful Dead and Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin, um, going back to my brothers, because I was the youngest, I never got to control the stereo, basically. So. <laughs> That's what they were, unless I was listening to Tina Turner on my Smurf Walkman. Um, but uh, so that's what I, that was the music I listened to sort of by osmosis through, through them. And that was what I was playing in bands and a lot of acoustic music. And um, so that's mixed in there as well. So I'm, though I'm always trying to write this sort of lost jazz standard, you know, this thing that sounds like a jazz standard, but it's not. I, you can't take the classic rock out of the girl, you know, like uh, it's, it's in there. So, you know, it's, I guess people say sometimes it's Americana. Some people say it's uh, pop jazz or jazz pop, you know, that's what it sounds like. Um, and then in terms of the bright nowhere record, I mean, in 2000, so I've, I'm doing, I'm going along in my life doing my music thing. And um, uh, in 2000, uh 10 roughly um 2010 no 2011 sometimes the dates are what is time anymore after a global <laughs> pandemic <laughs> um uh my mom got diagnosed with ovarian cancer a uh, really rare and aggressive form and i pretty much gave up music and moved home to 
Wilmington, Delaware slash Chads Ford, Pennsylvania. That's where I grew up and moved into my parents' house with my mom and dad to take care of her. Um, and so this batch of songs, Bright Nowhere, um, that are on this album come out of that experience. You know, I couldn't write music for about the first year and a half of my time taking care of her. Her care was just way, way, way too intense. Um, but I kept notes about what I wanted to write and songs I would write if I found my way back to music. So eventually I did. I mean, my mom died in, in 2015 and after helping to get my dad kind of back up on his, on his feet and, um, you know, the ship sailing straight ahead, I, I was able to continue working on some of the songs I wrote um, while she was alive and that she got to hear. And then, uh, you know, and then started making the record. So. Well, I was going to do this later in the interview, but I'll, I'll, I'll hit it right here because sure. it's the perfect lead in um, mm -hmm. for the, the listener. Um, I would highly recommend a Ted talk uh, that Kate gave um, on this subject. Um, it's one of the only Ted talks I've ever heard where a person mm -hmm. sings uh, for one, uh, but you. it was a really heartfelt um, talk that you gave. And I think it was Westchester. If yeah, Westchester, it PA. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a TEDx talk to be totally precise. Um, but uh, yeah, it's and you can find it on the TED on the TED uh, website, and it's called a grief casserole. Um, so if you if you Google that and TED or TEDx, it'll pop up for sure. Well, so I wanted to to talk about this a little bit more um, because I think we have all experienced loss, and if we haven't, you will. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, in my life, I, I lost a fiance, I'm grandmother, so uncle, et cetera, to cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and my girlfriend's uh, mother, 10 years ago, um, walked into an appointment and was told that she had stage four ovarian cancer and somehow is still living today. Yeah, um, it happens. <laughs> Good things happen too when you get some people are lucky. So if you're, are someone um, who was in your position and someone becomes sick in their life like that, what is your advice on what that person can, can do, you know, not only for that person they're taking care of, mm. but also how, what is your advice to people who are around the caregiver mm. um, of, of how they should interact with you? Because I think at, at that point in time, Sometimes you don't know what to say to your friend, or you don't know what to say to the person who's sick. What would your recommendations be? Sure. Um, well, this is essentially what I talk about in my TED talk. So the first thing I'd say is go watch the talk because it'll really help and then send it to everybody around you. Um, but to, to really answer your question, I mean, if you're wanting to reach out to someone who is going through loss of, of any kind, as you mentioned, there's, there's lots of, there's lots of different kinds of losses. It's not just death or a life limiting illness. It's losing a job. It's losing a marriage to divorce or to something else. It's, it's losing, you know, there's friendships. It's, it's a lot, there's a lot there. So, um, I think the, the, the first thing is to just What's, what seems to happen to most people is, is that they want to reach out. I believe fundamentally everyone's good and, and kind and compassionate and they, they, they want to reach out and say something to the person who's experiencing loss. And then um, the second after that impulse happens, there's like the self-critic and the, I don't know, conditioned voices come in and say, well, they're busy. Uh, who am I? I'm not close enough to them. I I never know what to say in these type, types of situations. I don't want to I don't want to bring it up. You know, all of these kinds of thoughts ha start happening right after that initial compassionate impulse. And and my message is, don't listen to those. Go with the initial impulse. And it doesn't have to be perfect. And it doesn't have to be pretty. Um, and it doesn't have to be in a specific form because a lot of people are like, but I don't want to email them, but maybe I should write a letter, but I don't, nobody writes letters anymore. Um, so 
it just pick pick a medium <laughs> and and write something but write it truly from your heart which for the most part is i can't imagine what you're going through i'm so sorry for your loss uh i just can't stop thinking about you and and how hard this must be for you and x and y and z and um i i, I love you and no need to respond and the important thing about that is obviously if you want to do more you can put that in there like i'm, I'm happy to help um but the most important thing is to just do it and to just be truthful. You know, in this day and age, not a lot of people want to hear about uh, you're, you know, you're in my prayers or my. There's some of that language that's that's floating around that's gotten a little hollow. So I always say, just say what if you can't if you don't even know what to say, then say that, because that communicates to me that you're you understand kind of where I'm where I am, the person who's experiencing the loss, right? Because they don't know what to say either i mean right. what is it to say about mortality like um so you know and then the other key part there is no need to respond because the people that are experiencing loss most mostly are in some kind of a crazy overwhelming vortex of you name it like arrangements to be made terrible despondent horrible grief um, such that, you know, they can't get out of bed or they can't do the, no, you know, the, the normal things, or they've got a house full of people showing up, you know, whatever stage they're in, they don't have time, really. And you giving them the gift of saying, no need to respond is like, I mean, first of all, it's just, it is just, a, just a gift, like, it's like a such a ninja move, you know, like, because it's not about you. It's not about them getting back to you. It's about you telling them that you love them. And that's it, period, the end. So, I, you know, that's my, that's my one, <laughs> one long winded point. Um, and there's a couple of others that, you know, again, you can go listen to my TED talk and get those. But um, that, that I think is the most important thing. Because when I put together my TED talk, I had an incredible TED coach, TED talk coach, his name is Ryan Hildebrandt, who's amazing. If anybody's going to do a TED Talk, they should hire him. Um, but he gave me some great advice. And his advice was go talk to people about their experiences around grief and loss. I mean, obviously, I had experienced grief and loss. And not I have, many people have died in my life prior to my mom dying. So I had a, some facility with it. But he said, go talk to the average person, like the person that's going to watch your TED Talk and understand again, maybe, where they are. And I talked to 30 people. I interviewed 30 people from strangers to, you know, people that were very close to me to everybody, the whole gamut. And everybody said, I just don't know what to do when it happens. I don't know what to say. I do oh. it so badly. And I, I suck at doing this. Yes, I can tell you, I've been guilty myself. I have, um, some dear friends and she came down with breast cancer and given my past traumas around mm -hmm. cancer, I didn't know what to say. Right. And so but, I mean, we I all do, man. We all do, John. That's the thing. Like we live in a culture that doesn't want to deal or acknowledge or learn how to be with mortality. Right. And that's, that's what this record's about. And that's actually what sort of, by default, my life has com come to be about a lot is that thinking and looking at and really be learning to be with death and mortality is actually makes your life so much better. Because you can't have the dark without the light. So when you go to that place of really learning how to be with it and just hold that space and, and just be able to say, I don't know what to say, but I'm here for you um you start to understand that my ability to do that gives me so much more life in my life i don't know i don't know how else to say it no i it's, think that's i think that's beautiful and is it all right if i tell a story sure of course please so september of 2020 and if you're a regular listener mm -hmm. to the podcast i've brought this up before but it's been a while um, my sister had just visited my parents. Um, 
with her son for a couple weeks, but was feeling very lethargic and just not herself, couldn't do the things that she needed to. And so she went in um, to get it looked at. And at the time they thought that something was going on with her bile duct. And I'll never remember. Uh, so they went in, um, ended up finding a mass um, and doing a biopsy. And she's thinking that it's this minor thing going on. And um, ultimately it was pancreatic cancer. Oh, and, and so when that happens, not only does their life change in that instant, but, but yours does too. And then I, a few months later, um, we thought that given the chemo she was doing, everything was fine. And it unfortunately spread. Now, so sorry. The, the, the long story short is this year has been an amazing year for her because somehow I think through her own intentionality and actions, she was able to reverse it. Um, and I think a lot of it, who knows what the cosmic things that, that happened were, but she was able to get the Whipple surgery and everything else. But mm -hmm. throughout all of this, uh, what was so hard for me to, to watch is it wasn't like in the pre-COVID world where you had someone that could sit with you through chemotherapies, where yeah. you could have someone be there in the hospital with you as you're getting ready to do all these different procedures and surgeries. Mm -hmm. She had to bear it all by herself. And similar to what I said about my friend, during this period when you know I was feeling these emotions, some of my closest friends never said a word to me. And the most ironic thing was a person I didn't know even that well um, could see I was hurting. And he came up just out of the blue and handed me a uh, small cross that was in the form of almost like a rock. And you know, I don't think he realized what it meant to me because for the next six to seven months, you know, I would carry that around everywhere I went. And if I was feeling grief or sadness or something else, I'd always reach down in my pocket and, you know, hold on to that cross. Wow. Which be a story. And and so I think my advice would be just something as little as as that can matter so much to someone and you don't know how you're going to touch someone. Yeah. And I, and just to well, first of all, thank you for sharing that story. And um, just to be totally clear, your sister's alive now. Yes. Yeah. Um, against all, all the odds. The yeah, MD against Ander all the odds. So. MD Anderson calls her like the stuff of legend because it just wow. doesn't happen. Wow. Well, amazing. And I'm so, I'm so glad you get to spend more time with her. And she yeah. gets to spend more time with you and with the world. But um, amazing. I, I guess I wanted to say that you just touched on the second point of my story, one of the other points of my TED talk. I don't remember now what order they're in, but that um, the other thing that goes through people's mind, you know, I've kind of alluded to it before was like, when they know someone is going through loss, they say, oh, I don't, I don't want to disturb them. And like, and then, okay, well, if they get over that, they usually what they say, and you will find that you said it yourself once and I did too, <laughs> um, we all do, is we say like, let me know what I can do to help, right? Or we say something like, I just, you know, give me something to do or like, you know, just reach out if you need help. And again, the person who's going through the loss, they don't have the bandwidth to, you know, direct you to do something like they just don't. And, and they, for many reasons, I don't need to go into like, but if you just do, Right. If you just do, if you just walk up to John and give him a little rock, if you just show up at your friend's house with a bag of groceries, even if you're pretty much sure that you got all the wrong groceries, like chances are, if there's something going on, someone lost in the family, there's a lot of people coming in and out of the house. Somebody will eat those groceries, you know, like in this day and age when people are vegan and gluten free and all this stuff, I don't give a shit. Just go buy the groceries and bring them into the house, you know? Um, just just do something and don't ask for permission. Um, so the, you, that's a just a great, that's a perfect example of that, right? The guy just, that, that took some courage. That, it takes courage to do that. It takes courage to walk into someone's house, house and set down a bag of groceries and walk out the door, you know? It takes well, courage to walk up to somebody and give them something 
You know, we're all afraid of rejection. Um, but you will never know, you know, the impact of just deciding to act and, and using, you know, using your heart to say, like, what would really help them right now that I don't even need to ask them to do? Well, I mean, to cl close the story out, um, I l was able to run into him again about seven to eight months after he gave it to me. And I was able to, to express to him um, how much it meant to me. Um, mm. And uh, so, you know, I, I think that's another thing I would encourage people to do is if you're in that situation, you know, when the timing is right, because in, in those moments, it's typically not, mm -hmm. you know, eventually find a way to, to thank the people for reaching out. Sure. Yeah. Well, I wanted to use this um, as a segue into talking about uh, the life coaching that you do. Mm. And I'm wondering, has the perspective of being around your mom, you know, being her caretaker, having this new feeling about, uh, you know, your place in the cosmos and mm -hmm. et cetera, has it changed the way that you coach clients? And if so, what, what way? Mm. Man, we could talk for hours and hours about this. Um, but of course, yes, it's changed the way uh, I coach people. Um, you know, for a while there, and maybe I still will at some point start calling myself a death coach or a grief coach, you know, um, I seem to be able to talk about and be with um, mortality uh, and, you know, other people's mortality, my own mortality in a way that, of course, I, I really didn't have the access to before I spent, you know, what what basically became five years, four and a half years of um daily care for a person who was dying um and well, at the same time personal growth yeah of course i mean amazing personal growth i mean what i say about it now is that experience is that it was the profound you know uh experience of my life and i've had lots of profound experiences in my life but th that one is it that's the sort of watershed moment and that I would do it again in a heartbeat. It was the hardest thing I've ever done, ever. And I've done a lot of hard things. Um, and that was the hardest thing I've ever done, but I would do it again in a heartbeat from the get-go and I wouldn't change any any bit of it. As, as hard and as grueling and as um, terrible as it was in, and awesome in, in, in awesome and awesome and sublime in both meanings of that word. Um, so personal growth wise, um, I think it's just allowed me as a coach to show up. Typically my clients are, we work for a year. It's a one-on-one -on -one coaching situation. We work for a year together or more. And I, in a lot of ways, I get closer to them than their partners or the people in their life, which is how I, I love that kind of relationship. And, and that's the goal is I'm, you know, I focus on people making change in their life and, and usually very big changes. And so just because we're mortal, usually a loss shows up of some kind during that time. And I'm able to respond to that in a way that someone else who hasn't had this much experience probably can't, or maybe cannot, I don't know. But I know I've been through this now with clients since my mom died and my dad died this May. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was a, a different kind of journey, but it was a, it was an amazing journey. It really changes how I can respond to them, to people. Because as we've said, most people aren't skilled at this part of their life. Um, and not only for them, but how they show up for other people. Maybe it's not, maybe they don't experience the loss. Maybe my clients aren't experiencing the loss, but their best friends are. Um, so I can really help them with that. And then um, I think just personally, I, I mentioned in taking my mom from diagnosis to her death, I had to do that, basically. I mean, I don't have a diagnosis other than I'm human, so <laughs> I'm dying every day. And uh, I had to look at, am I, was I ready to die? Because And so it made me, in, I am so attuned to the preciousness of every single moment, truly, in a way that is... Um, 
people, my friends, my partner say like, this is, you know, this is what, this is who you are for me. You, you remind me constantly of like how it all could change in a moment, you know, how, how precious this, this, this present moment is and this time together. Um, and so I've done the work to be ready to die myself. I've let everybody know that needs to know what, how I feel, you know, I've planned my funeral. Uh, I know where my ashes are going to go. You know, I know who's playing at my funeral. Um, I know who's getting what guitars, you know? <laughs> um, so once you do that, you know, there's a, there's a lightness actually that's available. Well, you know, it's interesting. There's a, you know, there's the bucket list and then there's this thing called the reverse bucket list, which is actually- oh, I never heard of that. What's that? The reverse bucket. So I interviewed this, this guy, <laughs> Trav Bell. I'd never heard of it before. And how he got this, I have no idea, but his website is the bucket list guy. Amazing. And, and he came up with this thing called the reverse bucket list. And it's actually your done list. It's, mm. you know, a lot of people lack confidence. They don't think that they can take on the next challenge. Mm -hmm. And he said, oftentimes the best starting point is to go back to your done list. Because mm. as you look at all the things that you've accomplished, you'll think about those and go, how in the world did I pull some of those things off? And it makes you feel better about yourself. Nice. But I was thinking you could almost take that same concept and go from the work that you did and back into, you know, if, if this is my ending point, then in reverse logic, what are the things that I want to do to accomplish it? And yeah, I mean, what do you want to do before, you know, my mom got diagnosed. I was in the room when the, when the doctor came in in the wee hours to say, we, you know, we biopsied your tumor and, and here's what we found. And he gave her the bad news because she had a very rare and aggressive form that they basically don't study. He, you know, it's a 50, 50 chance you can get the garden variety ovarian cancer, which let's be honest, isn't really studied as much as breast cancer. And, and that, but they study it at least, uh, or you can get this other kind. And unfortunately my mom got the other kind. And so they were like, cross your fingers and hope basically. Right. And, um, you know, uh, I looked her in the eye the second he left the room and I just said, you know, what do you want to do before you die? Who do you want to be? You know? And, and I said, we're not mincing words because this is going to kill you, whether it kills you two months from now, two years from now, 20 years from now, who knows, you know, it's going to be the thing that kills you. So no, we're just, we are starting from the end. Like you're dead <laughs> now, every minute you have that's given back to you that we're pouring back into the glass. What do you want to do with that time? Yeah. Well, it's a tip, a completely different way to think about how you live. And I did a, an episode a few weeks ago that I said, I talked about the importance of life's transition points. And it's a concept mm -hmm. a lot of people don't. I listened to that episode. Well, well, thank you. Well, I, yeah. if, if you're not familiar what a transition point is, it just as in songwriting, which you do, there yeah. are those linkages that you do between different parts of the song. And we have them in our own lives. It's those mm -hmm. moments, those ordinary bits of time that we have every single day that we mindlessly go through that I think actually define in the end of our life who we are. And mm -hmm. it's how do you intentionally go throughout those transition points? I believe that really matters because mm -hmm. you can create this bucket list. And according to, to Trav, <laughs> only about 10% of people actually have one. And out of the 10% who have one, only a small percentage actually write it down. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're not consciously going after showing up in those transition points, you're not going to achieve the intention of your life that you want mm -hmm. is I think an interesting way to look at it. So as you're coaching these clients and they're wanting to change or they're wanting this or that, what mm -hmm. do you typically find is the first starting point that you've got mm -hmm. to take them on? Oh man, you know, caveat is everybody's different. You know, they're coming for different reasons. Um, but I think really where I come from and where, um, you know, where my coaching is based out of is this 
this awareness of mortality, you know, this experience I had and, and my Zen practice, which is really, really deep. And, and this idea of like, we create our world. You know, I had an experience when I was 14, the day I started at prep school, um, I walked into the building where I was going to live and, you know, my parents were dropping me off. They drove up there in our station wagon, got, got everything in the back of the car. And I walked through the doors of that building and I'll, and I realized that, oh, wait a second. This is the first time in my life. I've never been somewhere with an older brother, um, who to define me or to define myself against or where someone's going to say, oh, you're Porter's little brother, you're Jake's little sister, you're Porter's little sister, you're Jake's little sister, or, oh, you're your mom's, um, you know, daughter. Uh, and and it, I, I, I just had this flash that it was this clean slate. And it totally flipped my mindset. And I went from being like a kind of mediocre run of the mill, happy go lucky kid to still happy go lucky. Lots of friends of all different kinds, athletes, artists, you know, I was into everything and everyone. But um, I just realized like, oh, the way I think about it can change the whole trajectory of how this goes down. And so it did. I mean, you know, I wouldn't have gone to Harvard if that hadn't happened. I wouldn't have played two division one sports. I wouldn't have done, you know, been mountaineering in, in Alaska. I wouldn't have done all these things that I've done in my life, created all these albums, you know, et cetera. So that's where I come from. That's, that's where we start is that like, do you know that you are not your thoughts? And once you know that, what are you, what happens in that space? What do you do with that? How do you, what fills it? Um, you know, luckily for me, I, I attracted, I guess you could say, a, a life coach of my own. Of course, I have a life coach. I mean, don't get a life coach who doesn't have a life coach. <laughs> like, it's like going to a doctor without a doctor who doesn't go to the doctor. Um, but uh, I, luckily for me, I, I attracted early on a life coach who this is his philosophy. So it was sort of, it was already there in me. It wasn't so articulated as, as it is now, but this is his philosophy. His name's John Morgan, JP Morgan Jr. And, um, you know, he's my coach now and has been, and, um, and you know, it's about, it's about creating what you want to see because that's, that is how we experience the world. We only experience the world through the glasses that we have on our face, what called our eyeballs, you know, and <laughs> called our mindset. Well, it definitely starts with the beliefs that it get ingrained with you. And many of them mm -hmm. come from, I call them societal norms that For condition sure. us oftentimes to become someone who I think we are not, you know, I mm -hmm. call this people are becoming more and more shrouded in pretense, mm -hmm. um, trying to be someone that they're not trying to pretend to those around them to be a different persona of who they actually are. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I really think it's leading to why so many people are becoming disengaged is mm -hmm. because if you're not pursuing your calling, mm -hmm. then you're going to get frustrated and you're, you're going to feel like inside, you know, you're not, you're not living your calling. And then I, I personally, you know, believe it, it all comes down to the choice. Are mm -hmm. you going to choose to stay in the status quo of where you're at, you're at, or are you going to choose to take that leap, which is going to require you to do a whole bunch of work? Yeah, because, you know, whether it's it's overcoming trauma, you know, which I think many of us have to do most of us or, have or and it, even if or, or, you know, generational trauma, you know, it, it you know, unless you're willing to do those uh, cycles uh, and mm -hmm. you've got to commit to it, nothing's going to happen. So I think that that that's really good. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think we I think we have to say, like, all of us are so lucky, especially this this meaning me wearing white skin and being a female and and like there's there's ways in which and nowadays we have to kind of acknowledge like i said generational trauma and there's some things there too that like we need to talk about and air and look at like in your thinking you mentioned societal conditioning like so much of that is is present and and trying to peel those layers 
first, do you realize that they're there? If so, how are they there? In what way are they coming out? And so this is just more of like, almost, do you know that your thought, you, you aren't your thoughts and, and okay. So if you aren't your thoughts, like, well, what are those thoughts that you're having and who put them there? And did they even come from an experience in your life or were they from your ancestors or the color of your skin and, and the way the dominant culture looks at that? And, and it's not a one walk dog, right? I think is what you're saying is like, there's so much work there. You got to take that dog out for a walk all the time. And, and that's why having a, having someone to help you and listening to people like you, because all this stuff, it comes, it hits you when it hits you. It hits you when it hits you. It, it, sometimes you're not ready to hear this kind of stuff or not ready to go there. Right. And that's why what you're doing is so, that's why um, it's so amazing to live when we live during this time period. Like someone's going to hear this podcast or hear any of your podcasts and something's going to hit. When I was 14 and had that, you know, epiphany, there was nothing like this. There was no, you know, maybe I would have stumbled upon a Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, which I read when I was like 12, but only because my brothers were reading it, you know, <laughs> like, so uh, it's just an amazing time. And, and I guess the only other thing I'd like to say is just like, you know, go easy on yourself, <laughs> <laughs> you know, self-compassion is, is a huge part of, of what I work on myself and what I work on with my clients. Well, I think that is a beautiful moment we had just there. Um, I, I don't want to get to the end of this podcast and not recognize some of the incredible accomplishments you've had. Mm. Um, having been a Division One athlete myself, um, I realize how much of that uh, impacts your school life because mm -hmm. you're spending anywhere between four to five hours a day Oh, easily <laughs> on, on those sports. And what I found is, you, you know, at the end of the day, they kind of own you because yep. you're, you've got to do what they're you asking. You got to perform. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you went into Harvard with two very different sports than mm -hmm. what most women would have gotten into, if that's an okay way to characterize sure, of it. Course. Yeah. Um, hockey and uh, women's lacrosse. Mm -hmm. Um. So I wanted to, to ask you, um, what were the biggest learnings that you had from playing those division one sports? Oh man. Well, I have to say, I have to give Harvard a big shout out because Harvard at the time, and I believe still, um, really championed people playing more than one sport if they could, if they were skilled enough and talented enough and worked hard enough and if they wanted to. And so I went, I had many people on both my teams who played more than one sport. I had a few women who played three sports, three division one sports at Harvard. Um, and I know men, you know, t classmates who played, which is totally unheard of. Like really, you never hear of a guy playing more than one sport in a division one school. Um, and that's a Harvard, that's a Harvard mentality. I mean, when I was recruited for these sports, you know, I went to, lots of other places who I'm sure you can, you know, think of the names that I went to and they, and I told them that I intended to play both women's ice hockey and women's lacrosse. You know, I would be talking to both coaches while I was being recruited and they were like, no, you won't be doing that here. You'll pick one. And I was like, well, you'll be talking to me later because I had already had a bit of a relationship with Carol Kleinfelder, the incredibly celebrated, amazing female um, women's lacrosse coach legend um who was my coach at the time you know was coaching there won the national championship for an ivy league school it's really hard to do she did it um you know was in touch with the coach at the time at harvard john dooley and they were like sure if you want to play three go for it come on we'll support you um so i just have to say that first of all like harvard is was has this incredible culture that allows somebody to do that um, and supports you doing that. And so what are the biggest learnings? Um, I mean, you know, you captured it, which is like, it's a full-time job. I mean, you have, you have to learn how to show up. I love the word you use show, you use the word show up earlier and you have to learn how to show up 
you know, performing every single day, because at that level, you're, you're playing for your spot pretty much every day in practice and in games, um, you know, and how to balance a really rigorous academic schedule. Um, if that matters to you, uh, you know, I have a lot of teammates who, you know, that's not, that wasn't their highest priority after hockey or lacrosse, just to be a totally honest, you know, there are people, people have a spectrum of what they expect out of themselves. But um, for me, you know, at um, athletics and academics, I was, was totally, you know, obsessed by. So I think what I learned from that experience, I mean, is so much. It's like, first of all, how to balance that much pressure all the time, basically, you know, you've got six hours of practice and you've got to go home and read, you know, Moby Dick in three days and um, write a, you know, 10 page paper on it. Like, and oh, by the way, you're going to, you know, Brown and uh, UNH tomorrow to play two games and blah, blah, blah. I mean, just, I can just like that. That's your life. How do you deal with that? You know, how do you take care of yourself? Of course. And then of course, how to be a teammate. I mean, team is so important to me. And I told, I shared with you that like, I have to get off this podcast very soon because I'm going to support a teammate of mine who became a very decorated Olympian and is getting honored tonight um inducted into a sports hall of fame and uh yeah i'm driving three hours to go to to go see her get this award and then i'm driving three hours home because team is is everything yeah so it definitely teaches you how to prioritize your time uh, for sure i and i also thought that it really taught me to have much stronger intentionality because mm. as i right. Look at, as I look at what makes, you know, an average athlete versus a world-class athlete, it really comes into the tiny, again, transition points that make up the mundane of all mm -hmm. the things that you're doing from the meals that you choose to eat to the activities that you choose to do outside of the sport to how you're approaching each day in the sport, how you're mm -hmm. showing up uh, with your teammates, et cetera. So yeah. I, I think your explanations went hand in hand with that. You nailed it. I mean, intentionality. And I have to say, like, I went to, I played those two sports when there was no internet. <laughs> there were no cell phones, um, you know, and thank goodness, I couldn't imagine doing it now <laughs> for many reasons, for the shenanigans that went on that I'm very glad do not exist on and in, you know, in a digital format, but like, um, you know, so much of that. I mean, they just think of how much we know about eating and sleeping now, you know, and um, I think it, it, it teaches you to, to kind of always be growing, you know, always be growing because you have to if you want a spot on that team, you know, and so that that idea of like, I'm always looking for the edge, right? You're always looking for the edge. And also the great thing about team is that they're pushing you. You know, you're getting pushed, look for your edge constantly, which is so beautiful um, and so amazing. And when as a, you know, luckily for men, hey, they can continue to do this in professional sports, you know, like for women, you know, it's just so, um, how shall I put it in the most, you know, I feel the, the loss of a team every day. I mean, I have a team, I have a team that helps me with my social media and I have, you know, I have teams in other parts of my life, but a team like that, you know, is a truly incredible experience. Yeah, which is why I think many veterans r really uh, miss that yeah. teamwork sure. that they had when they were serving. Yeah. You nailed it, yeah. Well, if someone would like to learn more about you, um, get a copy of your album, mm -hmm your book, which we didn't get a chance to cover, but I'll make sure I put it in the show notes um, sure. on, on songwriting. How can yeah. they, how can they do that? Uh, the best place to find me is kateshut.com. I mean, that's my personal website. So K-A-T-E-S-C-H-U-T-T. -T. Uh, but on the socials, you can get to that as well. And it's just at Kate Shutt. So at symbol K-A-T-E-S-C-H-U-T-T. -T. And if you go to either of those places, you'll find me and you can get right in touch with me. I mean, I, I read my email, I <laughs> respond to DMs, you know, I'm, I'm there. Okay, well, I'm gonna just end by asking you three or four quick questions. Please. And then, 
So the first would be, is there a book other than your book yeah. <laughs> that you would recommend uh, to the listeners? Oh man, uh, name a category. Like, I mean, you know, as an English major, so reading is, is my life. Um, nonfiction, fiction, what do you, what do you want? Well, let, let's go nonfiction. Okay. Um, oh man, there's so many. Um, there's so many, but I'll just pick one and it's not my final answer, but it's my answer for whatever time it is. One fifteen on uh, December 9th or 8th, whatever day this is. Um, uh, my answer is there's nothing wrong with you by uh, Sherry Huber. She's a Zen teacher. She's my Zen teacher. That book came to me in a very mysterious way and changed my life. Um, and if you're a person who thinks or has ever thought that there might be something wrong with you in whatever way, you know, you have really, you have uh, really loud negative voices or a lot of a tendency to be super critical of yourself. That would be a great book to check out. There's nothing wrong with you by Sherry Huber. Um, okay. That's great. Yeah. And um, you also took a break between the first two years and last years at Harvard to attend okay. the Berkeley school of music. I did. Just a very easy place to get into. <laughs> um, what, what do you think the biggest lesson you learned at Berkeley that you've applied to your music career? Oh my God. Um, it's just more hard work. Like, you know, like I, I, I think you and I touched on this before, but like I left Harvard to, I dropped out of Harvard to go to Berkeley College of Music and I got, um, you know, I was rudely awakened to the fact that um, everybody there had been playing their music like I had been playing sports all my life. You know, of course, they're at music school, like, duh. But like, um, and, you know, the biggest lesson there was just, for me, was just, oh, wow, you're really bad. I, mean, I was really bad at music, like, comparatively. Oh. And the power of just um, ignoring everybody else, because if I, if I had paid attention to how great everybody was, which they were. I went to school with some amazing musicians. Um, if I had paid attention to that, I would have flamed out. Like the self-hate would have been too big. So I, I, I taught myself at that time, before I had a coach or anything, I taught myself to switch off my mind and not look, I put blinders on and just say, I gotta look at my own paper here. I gotta do, I gotta be my best you know, and, and just get to work. Um, so I think that's it. I mean, and, and, you know, in a very short period of time, I, I was able to up level my playing and my musicianship, but I think it's only because I was able to keep my eyes on my own paper and just, that was my mantra. Like whatever they're doing, doesn't matter. You're, okay. you're just trying to be your best. Okay, and I got two two more for you. So, sure. if there's someone that you have never met who's alive or deceased, who would it be? Mm. Oh man, hmm. someone I've never met who's alive, or dead. Hmm. Uh, I'd love to meet Ella Fitzgerald. I'd love to know Sarah Vaughan. Those okay. two really. Those are two great them. ones. Yeah. And, and then th this is one of my favorite questions I always ask. Um, and I got to ask it to an astronaut too, <laughs> but it's who, who might have the chance to actually do this. If, if you were selected to go on the mission to Mars and they gave you one rule that you could establish for this new planet, what would it be? Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, it would have to be respect for the planet, <laughs> you know? uh to live to live within to live in balance with the natural environment you know, okay well that's great respect for mother mars i'd have to say <laughs> <laughs> well kate thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast and being vulnerable especially with your mom uh, and sharing so many important lessons it was a true pleasure to have you and thank you again thanks john i'm really thankful to be here and really um like i said really want to acknowledge you for what a great podcast you've created, what great conversations you're creating in the world and how many lives you're changing with the kinds of uh, places you're willing to go with your 
your own thinking and your own conversation. So thank you. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. What a heartfelt interview that was with Kate Shutt. And thank you, Kate, again, so much for doing this and being so vulnerable and sharing your story with our audience. During the show, we spoke about a few past podcast episodes. One was episode 82, which is a solo episode I did on life's transition points. Another was episode 44 with Trav Bell, who goes by the bucket list guy. I would encourage you to check out both of those amazing episodes. The books that Kate and I spoke about today, along with her TED Talk and also her own personal book and album, will all be in the show notes where you can find on passionstruck.com slash podcasts. We will also include those books in our growing book list, which you can also find on passionstruck.com slash books. And I would encourage you to check all of them out. I did want to let you know that the links that are on that site are affiliate links, which go to supporting everything we do here on the show and keeping the lights on. And if you're looking for another way to absorb our content, we also have a YouTube channel at John R. Miles, which has over 200 different videos on it. Some the long form interviews like today, as well as mindset moments, which are two to five minute videos on a variety of different topics. We categorize all our videos based on playlists so you can find topics that interest you. And speaking of interesting you, if there's a guest you would like to see me interview, or there's a topic that you would like me to unpack in a solo episode, please reach out to me on Instagram at John R. Miles. And if you truly love the show, please post it to social media, tag us in your post, and share what you loved about the episode. Thank you for helping us on our mission to help people worldwide live intentionally. Now go out there and do it yourself. Thank you so much for joining us. The purpose of our show is to make passion go viral. And we do that by sharing with you the knowledge and skills that you need to unlock your hidden potential. If you want to hear more, please subscribe to the Passion Struck podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts at. And if you absolutely love this episode, we'd appreciate a five-star rating on iTunes and you sharing it with three of your most growth-minded friends so they can post it as well to their social accounts and help us grow our Passion Struck community. If you'd like to learn more about the show and our mission, you can go to passionstruck.com where you can sign up for our, our newsletter, look at our tools, and also download the show notes for today's episode. Additionally, you can listen to us every Tuesday and Friday for even more inspiring content. And remember, make a choice, work hard, and step into your sharp edges. Thank you again for joining us. 